So welcome back uh, everyone for our webinar series. So now with uh, the great help from uh, Cassini. And uh, today we have the great pleasure to welcome uh, Daniel Torrent. Uh, so Daniel uh, graduated uh, with a PhD from uh, University of Valencia uh, about 12 years ago, a bit more actually. And then he was for many years a very prolific and successful researcher in, in France, in Lille, and then in Bordeaux. And I think in Bordeaux, he even had shared excellence of CNRS and University of Bordeaux, which is quite prestigious. And then he went on to, you know, um, from success to success to go back to uh, Spain. And uh, so after all these years of very uh, successful research, uh, he started to look at quasi-periodic structures, and today Daniel is going to talk about multiple scattering analysis of quasi-periodic clusters of uh, scatters, which looks like a very uh, fascinating uh, topic. Professor Torrent. Okay. Thank you very much for your introduction, Sebastian. Uh, well, as Sebastian said, I'm, I'm going to talk about the, the use of multiple scattering for the analysis of quasi-periodic structures in two and one dimensions. Uh, we will focus on waves uh, propagating in flexural waves, on plate, uh, that is on plate waves. And essentially what I'm going to show is how we can use this uh, theory to analyze small clusters of scatterers, which is what we normally have if we have a handmade uh, a, a sample or a handmade structure to analyze. And well, we will see that multiple scattering of fields a very deep analysis of the phenomena that we can find in, in this type of structure. So essentially what I'm going to present is the work of uh, our PhD student, Mark Marti Sabate. Uh, most of the slides are also done by himself. So I have to admit that essentially I'm presenting his, his work on this topic. And well, as an outline, I will uh, begin with a very brief introduction to multiple scattering theory. Maybe most of you are already familiar with this, uh, with this method. Then I will focus on a couple, I will summarize a couple of publications uh, that we have recently uh, published, which is the analysis of one dimensional quasi periodic uh, scatterers and twisted beliers. This could be the analog of a very fashionable topic right now, which is the similar, the analog of the twisted the magic angle graphene. And then I will finish with, the, with our ongoing work in which we have analyzed uh, anisotropic twisted beliers, in which we have included anisotropy in these, uh, in these structures. And well, we are finding some interesting, probably only geometrical properties, but uh, I think it's a good occasion to present them and obviously we are still open to discussion in this, in this topic. Well, multiple scattering theory for us uh, begins in, with this geometry. We will have a couple of scatterers attached to a thin elastic plate. We will focus only on the flexural wave uh, for, of the flexural motion of the, of the plate so that you know that we can use a self-contained equation in the sense that a flexural, wave equation, flexural waves follow a given equation and we can analyze them independently of the other polarizations. And normally we use this notation, alpha and beta for the running for all the scatterers in a, in a given cluster. And well, the, the, the procedure is probably as uh, you know, we have a cluster of scatterers, we have some incident wave that begins to be scattered uh, by all the other part, uh, objects of the, of the plate. And finally, we have some uh, radiation or some scattered, uh, some total scattered field. Well, mathematically, we, um, sorry. We uh, always propose the same type of solution. We have some incident field, which is something that we choose. This is the excitation field. And then we know that the total field over the, the plate in this occasion will be made by a linear combination of, uh, of radiative fields by all the other scatterers, where this coefficient, this coefficient is what we need to solve. This is the amplitude of the scattering by each uh, object in the, in the plate. This coefficient, which we have in a point-like approximation, we have only one coefficient per scatterer, can be solved from this equation here, which is a linear system of equations for n, equa n equations for n unknowns. 
So the thing is that this M matrix is made by two contributions. So we have the diagonal components which have the, uh, the information of the single scatter uh, properties, the T, the T alpha. It's called the T matrix in other domains because we don't have just one parameter, but we have a, a more complicated parameter, but we call this just the impedance of the scatterer. And then in the non-diagonal terms, we have the, the interaction terms, which corresponds to actually the Green's function of the corresponding wave equation. If this term is small, there is a small interaction between scatterers, that is for scatterers uh, separated a large distance in the cluster, and essentially the contribution is due to the single scattering condition, the single scattering properties only. So the thing is that uh, from this equation, we can solve for the uh, scattering after the excitation of one field, but we can also solve for the agent modes of the cluster, that is the solution where we don't have any incident field. This condition uh, can be obtained by setting this incident field equal to zero, that is there is no field, so that the only possibility of having a solution of this system of equations is having a, a a, a, um, having the determinant of the matrix equal to zero. In general, this will not happen for real frequencies because this is an open system and we don't have a real frequency satisfying this condition so that it happens only for complex frequencies where the imaginary part of the resonant of the agent mode give us the lifetime of the mode. However, since we are interested in, in high quality modes, in general, we can find uh, the, uh, an approximation of the real part of the resonant frequency by working on this part of uh, this part here, the smallest, the smallest agent value of the matrix N. One have this, is, uh, this small agent value, when we have a situation where the agent value is very, very small, is because the determinant will be also very small. It means that adding just a small part to the, a small imaginary part to the real frequency, we will satisfy this condition here. So that all around this world, what we are going to try is to find the, to the minimum agent value of the matrix M and see as a function of some parameter, the frequency, the anisotropy factor, the gamma of the resonators, etc. We will see how as a function of this parameter, we arrive to a minimum value. And when this value is very, very small, we can say that we are close to a resonant. And you will see that this is quite a straightforward method of uh, finding modes. Uh, well, for the flexural wave equation, as I, I said before, we have a, a very well-known uh, wave equation is this equation here. It's not the typical Helmholtz uh, equation. We have the fourth power here. It's the big harmonic uh, equation. And we have in the right-hand side part of the, of the equation, the collection of scatterers, of point-like scatterers that are going to interact with the incident field. There are some uh, physical properties of the, of the plate, which are the density, the thickness, and the, and the bending stiffness. And we have this quantity here, which is, as I said before, the impedance of each scatterer. Omega is, as usual, the, the frequency of the field. And this is the Green's function, which is the core of the, of the theory. The, green, the Green's function for this uh, equation, which is a two-dimensional equation, is made of two terms, the Hankel function of real argument minus the Hankel function of complex argument. So that actually it's an unusual Green's function in the sense that it is regular at the origin. You know that for Helmholtz equation, normally we have a divergence of the, of the Green's function at the origin. And when we work with uh, scattering, scattering by point scatterer, this is a problem because we have divergences at the origin that we have to regularize and so on. It's very easy to do, but it's, it's sometimes annoying. In this case, we don't, do, we don't need to do this. That's why I like with, uh, to work with this equation because numerically it's quite pedagogical and quite easy to, to manipulate. Well, uh, these are the parameters that we use in, in, this, in this work. We will, uh, we, have the resonant frequency of the, of the scatterers. Uh, we don't work with the traditional angular frequency. We work with this normalized omega uh, um, frequency, which is just the traditional frequency multiplied by some uh, physical parameters of the, of the lattice. And the, our model for the, for the resonator 
is based on this equation here, in which we have some uh, normalized mass of the resonators. We are using essentially a model in which the, uh, the resonator consists on a, a spring mass attached to the, to the plate. And this spring mass system has a resonant frequency, a complex resonant uh, fre uh, response, but it is characterized essentially by this gamma alpha parameter. In general, we avoid to work near the resonance so that uh, we characterize scatterers according to their gamma alpha parameter. If we are in a gamma alpha, which is very small, we say that we have a soft scatterer, but it is, if gamma alpha is quite big, nearly 100, 200, we say that we have a hard scatterer. Uh, we focus on this hard scatterer part because actually near a resonance, any scatterer will be also a hard scatterer. And we will see that effects uh, around the, the hardness of the scatterer are more interesting. Then we begin now the, the first of the problem that I wanted to, to discuss, which is the, um, the existence of edge or inter interface states in quasi-periodic linear arrays of scatterers. And this is the geometry that we are, that we are studying. Essentially, we have a two-dimensional space, which is our plate. And then we put a collection of point-like scatterers attached following some pattern. The pattern that, that follows these scatterers uh, is described here. Okay, we have typically a cluster of 125 scatterers, just for numerical convenience, let's say that 100 of scatterers, this, this is the number that we use to analyze. And essentially they follow this law for alpha going from one to 125, and 28, uh, we have a set of regularly spaced positions plus this quasi-periodic contribution. R is just some uh, modulation amplitude and the parameter that we are going to study deeply is the tecta. This, uh, this, ang this angle gives us the quasi-periodicity of the cluster. This cluster is not periodic, it's never repeating itself unless tecta be, theta be a, a rational number. Okay, you can see the physical inter the geometrical interpretation of this parameter in this picture here is taken from a uh, physical real materials published by Emil Prodman. I think they use this uh, schematics in several works. But essentially what you can see is that uh, we have these uh, regularly spaced positions and at each position we add this uh, term R cosinus alpha tecta so that there is a not a random, but a different displacement for each scatterer. The result is that we don't have a periodic cluster unless theta via a rational, a rational number. Obviously, numerically, uh, all, the, all the theta will be a rational number, but normally we will have a large enough cluster to ensure that we don't have uh, any periodicity at all. So that's why numerically we use, uh, we use this, this configuration. Also, we work with a, a small, with a cluster with a small number of particles so that in general, we don't have periodicity at all. So now what we did first was to analyze the smaller eigenvalue of the M matrix as a function of the normalized frequency and the quasi-periodic uh, quasi -periodic parameter theta. For 100, nearly 100 of scatterers, uh, the resonant frequency is uh, quite above for, for us and we use a hard scatterer configuration. So this is the result of this, of this analysis, okay, in which uh, we see that the plot of the smaller eigenvalue has a broad, a large number of, of, of values. However, in the regions where we see a blue uh, spot is in the region of this configurational space where we expect a mode of the system. It means that we will have a lot of modes in this region here, but you can see that we can have also some modes, some vertical modes in these, uh, in these gaps of the configurational space. So this is the whole fact that the butterfly is well known in the theory of quasi-periodic materials and well, essentially we found it in, in, this, in this work as well. Uh, in order to see really the, the different modes, we have to make a, like a, a zoom of this uh, region here so that you can see how there are small uh, blue regions indicating that we will find a resonant mode 
in this neighborhood. Uh, actually, this, this resonant mode will, don't, will not have a very, a very high quality uh, because you will see that it's not, the, this value of the, the agent value, the, well, the minimum agent value is not very small. We need to add the mirror symmetric cluster as we did here in order to have a better a resonant mode. You will see it uh, better now. So the idea is that when we have the, the quasi-periodic uh, line of scatterers, the modes uh, that you see in this uh, gap region appear at the edge of the, of the cluster. However, we found that putting the same cluster, but with a symmetric, uh, with a symmetric, uh, with a mirror symmetric structure at the other side, we have the localization of the mode in this region here. These two clusters are identical, but one is the mirror symmetric with, uh, of the other one. And then we found that there is an increment of the quality factor of the, of the mode. This is quite obvious because if, the, if this is the cluster and we have the localized mode here, it is quite leaky because it can go anywhere. However, if we, if we can sell the propagation through this line, we can have the mode trapped here. We, of course, can have radiation here. That's why the, the real part, the imaginary part of the frequency will not be zero. However, we have a quite, a, quite a high quality mode here. This is the, um, well, the, the difference between the, the, two, the two butterflies. Would you see that the blue regions are more, uh, more clear in this, in this part? And then we analyzed the two types of modes that we can have in this, in, in this fractal map. We can have a mode here or a mode inside the, the gap of the butterfly. For the mode A, we have this configuration here. As you see, the mode is obviously a mode of the cluster, but it's localized all around the, the cluster. However, for this B mode, what we have is that the, the field is localized around the, the interface between the two mirror symmetric clusters, so that clearly this mode will be uh, what we could call an edge or an interface state. However, this is just um, a, a resonance due to, to the fact that we have a finite cluster itself. Well, we analyzed the, the robustness of these uh, structures by adding a, a, what we call a positional disorder to the, to the cluster so that what we have done is like we are working with multiple scattering theory uh, we, we have the position of each individual scatterer so that once we have a configuration, we can add a small amount of disorder to the position of each scatterer. Uh, this uh, small amount of position follows a, nor a Gaussian normal distribution of a given uh, variance sigma. What you see is the plot of the agent value, the smaller agent value as a function of the, of the frequency so that for a given configuration, and we see how the dips essentially remains uh, unchanged. So that for the outside the butterfly, we see that obviously we have modes, but they move a lot in frequency. However, we can see that some modes, even when we add a, when we add a large amount of disorder, they remain uh, essentially in the same frequency region. Also, although obviously, if we have a very large amount of disorder, we have uh, more more complexity in the in the cluster, so that somehow this is how numerically we analyze the the disorder. You can see, for instance, here the field distribution of several clusters uh, from the ordered case and the disordered case, just adding a small amounts of of disorder. Obviously, there is a small frequency shift in each situation. However, the shape of the mode remains uh, unchanged, so that we could say that there is some kind of robustness uh, related with this type of, of structures. Uh, well, I wanted also to show you a better zoom of the, um, of the butterfly for the uh, one dimensional array or the mirror symmetric uh, array. Essentially, this is for just the, the cluster and this is for the cluster plus the symmetric, uh, the symmetric cluster. You see how the modes are better defined here so that we will have a better quality resonances. And also you can see how there is a clear fractal uh, nature for these resonances. So that I think that the lecture that I, I, I did from this, from this system is that 
you can have a richness of modes, a, large, a high density of modes for different configurational parameters. You can see here a cut along this line of the agent value for the uh, non-symmetric or symmetric cluster. And you see how the, the agent value is clearly, it has clearly a minimum. However, for the symmetric cluster, we have a very deep uh, decreasement of the, of the um, agent value. It means that it, we obviously never arrive to zero because uh, this is only a numerical calculation. And also this, we need to add the imaginary part of the frequency to arrive to zero. But it is clear that for this situation, just adding a small, a small imaginary part to the frequency, we will arrive to a very high quality mode. However, in this occasion, in which corresponds to this configuration, we will need to add a large uh, imaginary part to the real frequency, which in terms means that actually we will modify the real part of the frequency so that we can ensure that the resonance in this occasion is near here, but here we know that it will be in this neighborhood, but we will need to make a deeper analysis. And well, this is just a demonstration of how we can use multiple scattering to analyze this uh, nice type of structure so that we move now to the, to the second part of the, of the presentation in which we are going to analyze a similar structure, but in two dimensions. In this case, we are going to work with, a, a, with two dimensional ar arrangement of, scatter, of, uh, of scatterers, but now rotated at a given angle each other. The key uh, quantity that will uh, appear here is uh, this thing, is the, the dipole, because uh, as you will see, this geometry consists in putting two periodic lattices and then adding a small angle between, between them. We will see that it will create a large number of scatterers that will be very close each other. If these scatterers are very close each other, means that the multiple scattering effects will be stronger in this uh, couple of scatterers than in the rest of the lattice. In this stronger multiple scattering effect, we will have uh, some kind of localized modes okay, which are dipolar modes, but they will be easily tunable because if we change slightly the angle between the two lattices, we are changing the frequency of the, of the resonant dipole and also the position in the, geometrical, uh, in the geometrical configuration. So that the equation that follows the resonances of just a couple of isolated scatterers is just that, as before, that the determinant of the M matrix be equal to zero, the determinant of this couple of scatterers is just a, a two times two uh, matrix, so that finally we have a very single expression for this determinant. is related with the T matrix of the of the scatterer, the Green's function as the uh, of the distance between the two scatterers. The Green's function at the origin appears here, but it is a finite quantity, so that there is no trouble at all. And then we have analyzed the, the solutions of these uh, couple of uh, scatterers as a function of the distance d between, between them. Essentially, what we, have, what we have found is that they follow this um, as a function of the, of the impedance of the, of the scatterer. Uh, essentially, they follow these uh, hyperbolic lines that depending on the distance between scatterers, they follow this line, this line, or this other line. So essentially what it means is that uh, for any, for any uh, gamma parameter, uh, we will have always a family of distance in which we will, we will find a resonant for the dipole. So that for a given family of scatterers, just rotating the, the cluster, we will move along these lines also in the resonant frequency. And you will see Again, these hyperbolic lines in the, in the following plots. Then inspired, as I said before, partially because of the, of, of the successful research of uh, twisted bilayers in graphene, uh, we try to analyze a similar structure for uh, twisted bilayers, but for plexular waves. Essentially, what we are doing is to combine a couple of lattices, uh, periodic, in, in, for flexural waves, and then rotating them a given angle. You can see here the patterns that are formed as a function of the angle. Probably you are familiar with more patterns. And what is remarkable and we have to, to keep in mind is that 
for a set of angles, we have a commensurability condition. That is, there are some angles in which we recover periodicity again for the, for the cluster. These commensurable angles, what we will create is a family of dipoles very close to each other. However, the periodicity of this, uh, of this moiré pattern depends on the rotation angle. And since we are working with finite clusters, we have to analyze those clusters large enough to present a couple of periods of the moiré patterns. Because if the cluster is very small and the period of the, of the moiré patterns is very large, we are seeing again just a, a non-periodic uh, cluster. Well, the condition for having a commensurability is very easy. Essentially, we take one lattice and the other one, and then we impose that for some n1 and n2, and m1 and n2, we have exactly the same position of the scatterer. For those angles, for those rotation angles in which we arrive to this condition, we will have a periodic, uh, a periodic pattern. What you are seeing here is essentially what I said before, the radius of the periodicity of the moiré pattern as a function of the rotation angle. So that as you see, there, is, there are a large number of situations, a large number of angles where we have this periodicity condition satisfied. However, if we are building clusters of this radius, we will have only few number of clusters presenting a, a periodicity. It means that only in this uh, small number of clusters, we will have a couple of dipoles, a couple of scatterers close, uh, close enough each other. You can see here these conditions, these moiré patterns for a cluster of a radius of nearly six. And you can see here how the, the moiré patterns becomes uh, periodic. There are some blue points and red points that remains the same. So to better understand the, this, uh, when we will have this uh, condition, we define the, some what we call the cluster potential, but probably it has another definition, with, which is essentially the summatory in all the scatterers in the cluster of the reciprocal of the distance between any, 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 cup, any, cup, any pair of scatterers. So that if we, are, if we plot this as a function of the rotation angle, for those angles where we have the commensurability condition, we will have a peak in this, in this function. Obviously, we will not have all the solutions that we found before because our clusters are small clusters. In this case, the cluster is smaller than in this one. So that, that's why in this occasion for the honeycomb or the triangular lattices, we have a small number of angles where we have the periodic uh, condition satisfied. However, if the cluster is larger, obviously we have a large number of angles where this condition is satisfied. This, is, this plot is very interesting because it will tell us around which angles we can expect the existence of resonances in the cluster, at least of dipolar nature. So this is the, the analysis that we did. Here you see the cluster potential. If this is a cluster of a radius of six or seven times the, the lattice constant. We see that we have a number of uh, peaks corresponding to those uh, angles in which we will have the periodicity condition, the commensurability condition, actually. And as you see, when we plot, uh, when we make a, a map of the minimum eigenvalue of the matrix M as a function of frequency, we have a large number of modes for small angles corresponding to this a small dipolar formation, but then as the angle increases, we have a, a, that the, um, the resonances disappear and they appear as well as a fun, uh, in the neighborhood of the commensurability angles. It means that around these angles, we have a couple of dipoles and then we can easily tune the resonance by just changing slightly the rotation angle so that small variation of the angle will produce large variation of the resonant frequency. But it also means that for a given resonance, we can have always a rotation angle, which will give us a, which will give us a mode. This is quite interesting because it means that if we want to design a cluster with resonances at a given frequency, the only thing that we need to do is with the same structure, rotate it until we arrive to this condition so that I find this quite uh, interesting. 
again, we are talking of hard scatterers. When we have soft scatterers, the situation is quite different. So this is the, the, shape, the shape that the molds have, so that uh, for, the, for a fixed angle, we have a large number of frequencies having resonances. This corresponds to this column here, in which essentially we have a small number of, uh, a large number of dipoles separated at very small distance. And then we see how uh, for different frequencies, the radius of, the, of these uh, resonant modes are smaller and smaller. So essentially these are just cluster modes as well. But here the, the horizontal line is the interesting, the interesting one because we see that for a fixed frequency, for different rotation angles, we have different uh, resonances, which as you can see, corresponds to the formation of uh, small dipoles due to the condition of quasi-periodicity. In these occasions, you see that we are very close to the border of the cluster, so that this commensurability condition was almost satisfied. If you remember the plot before, this, uh, in, in this angle, the periodicity of the Moiré pattern is very close to the radius of the, of the cluster. And you can see here as well how the different dipoles are formed in the different, uh, in the different uh, points of the Moiré lattice. Obviously, this happens at the same frequency. What happens from here to here is clearly that we rotate is, uh, slightly the cluster so that the distance of the dipoles change, but the resonant condition is satisfied in the following dipoles. And then it happens here and here and so on. So that, again, I find interesting the, the, the high tunability of this type of, of, of modes. Well, as I say, we analyzed the soft scatterer condition. And uh, what we can see here is that actually uh, the resonances, the nature of the resonances is less clear. We cannot say that this is actually a dipolar, it has a dipolar origin. The reason is that the scatterers are not hard enough to trap waves between a couple of scatterers, so that we need maybe more scatterers to form a, a destructive or constructive interference and then have a localization. Uh, well, we found no way to understand geometrically the formation of these modes. I think that they just appear, uh, maybe similar to a disorder system, but I have no experience on that, so that I'm going to avoid to say anything stupid. If anyone wants to comment on this figure, we focus on the hard scattered situation and we avoid this for uh, future works, let's say. And well, we move now to the final part of the of the talk uh, in which we analyze the, the same type of twisted structure, but now we focus on the uh, anisotropic, uh, anisot anisotropic uh, we focus on anisotropic lattices. So the idea is quite uh, intuitive. We, we, have, uh, we have analyzed so far uh, just uh, the triangular, the honeycomb or the, of, of the square, square lattice which are uh, isotropic lattices. And then now we wanted to do the same, but with a structure in which, in which the lattice is anisotropic. The anisotropy factor is defined in this way, so that we have a lattice uh, vector B and A with modulus B and A, and the parameter eta is called the anisotropy ratio, which is the ratio between B and A. Well, you can see here the evolution of the agent value map as a function of my computer used to crash in this uh, plot so that uh, be patient if it happens. Uh, otherwise you can enjoy the, the figure and this I find it, uh, quite interesting. We see how moving the anisotropy ratio, uh, all the agent value maps moves, especially, oh, okay, it crashed, sorry. I will restart, well, since I'm fine on time, uh, we can devote some time to discussion now. Well, the, the thing is that we see how obviously the agent, agent value. Uh, I'm sharing still my screen. All good. Yeah. Yeah, with your screen, Adam. Okay. Well, I will move to to next uh, figure. So that I'm sharing, right? Okay, so that again, obviously, changing the anisotropy ratio 
we change the geometry of the Moiré patterns, we change the condition of current measurability so that the different frequencies move along this, along this map. However, we wonder what happens when we fix the frequency, the resonant frequency, and then we analyze the map uh, theta as a function of the anisotropy ratio. And then we found this uh, at least curious figure. So that for a fixed frequency, we can see that a change in the anisotropy ratio and the rotation angle between the two lattices, we have this family of ellipses all around the, the, the map. If we make a zoom of this, of this figure, we find this interesting picture here. So that we can have like some modes that follows uh, straight lines, but we can see this elliptical movement of the, of the agent value as a function of the rotation angle and the anisotropy ratio. Well, if we plot the positive diagonal modes, that is a, just a mode located along this line, we find this situation where the resonant is due to this uh, couple of dipoles. So that is somehow obvious because we are in an anisotropic lattice now, so that things will appear in, in couple of two. This is for the negative diagonal mode, they appear here. And this is what we found for the modes located in the ellipse, in the different ellipses. It, it corresponds to uh, different dipoles rotated at a given angle. If we move, let's see if we don't crash now, but if we move along, along the, the ellipses in the configurational space, what we see is that the dipoles are following this uh, rotational uh, movement. And um, well, probably there is an obvious geometrical explanation for this, but bear in mind that we are rotating lattices and changing the anisotropy ratio. Oh, it crashes again, sorry. I think it crashes when it arrives to the end of the animation. And um, well, but just to say that uh, this is um, a very interesting result. At least it's interesting for us because we don't understand it. So that maybe once we understand it, uh, it will be uh, somehow trivial. Well, we did also a frequency sweep of these uh, ellipses, changing the frequency we arrived to this uh, weight behavior of the agent value. Again, I don't want to, to stop a lot of uh, time there because it will crash again. Um, well, essentially, uh, it, it is clear that this, uh, the, the existence of these resonances is due to a dipolar interaction between scatterers. However, what is funny is that changing slightly the, the geometry of the clusters, we can orientate dipoles, change their frequency, change their behavior, and so on. So that uh, we find that this type of structure in the dipolar regime, that is for hard scatterers, offers a, a broad tunability of modes. And we find this quite, quite interesting in, in general. Well, just to summarize, I say that multiple scattering is obviously a very powerful tool for the analysis of this type of, of structures. There are other methods, other methods, more or less complicated, I guess that more useful for large number of scatterers for materials like graphene, where you have a large amount, amount of atoms that you cannot uh, code individually. But if in our domain, usually we work with handmade structures in which the large number of scatterers approximation used not to be very, very useful. It is better to work with this type of theories to analyze this type of, of structures. And also it allows us to understand deeply the existence of this type of resonances, as in this case that we figure out that they are due to the, to the existence of these uh, dipoles. At the beginning it was not obvious for us because we found just the, the resonances and we say, okay, that's a really beautiful map but we don't know what's happening here. But obviously, once you plot the mode, you see everything, uh, everything clear. But well, I think that uh, this, this uh, work can be summarized that in something that was a surprise, a nice surprise for me, that there is a richness of uh, modes or of, of behavior in this, in this type of structure, which are actually made from very simple uh, materials. It's not like disorder where you need a very complicated structure. Here, you have just a couple of order lattices, you rotate them, and then you have all this uh, complexity. And the same can be applied to the one-dimensional uh, line. Uh, just to conclude, let me announce that uh, we have been awarded with a, with a, 
a Pathfinder project in, in the results that were published a couple of months, a couple of weeks ago. So that we are still preparing the, the grant agreement is being quite stressful. That's why I couldn't properly prepare this seminar because it's happening within the last couple of weeks. But well, uh, just to, to tell that it will be obviously based on phononics. We have a really nice consortium in which we will have a modeling, characterization, fabrication, optimization, and development of applications. Uh, the, the partners somehow are, uh, as you can see, they will, it, it will be the Imperial College in London with uh, Richard Craster and Sebastian Geno. And uh, well, in, in Poland with uh, Pavel Paco, which is also a frequent collaborator uh, in my recent works. And also in the CNRS in Paris with Bernard Bonello. And in Barcelona with my friend uh, Agustin Mi, he will be, he will make fabrication. He came from the domain of photonics so that uh, maybe not much of you know him. And finally, the coordination of the proposal will be done here in Castellón, in our small and probably not very beautiful city, but really comfortable for living. So that in any case, we will publish probably soon some job opportunities. So that feel free to contact me if you want further details about this, um, this project. And well, that's all from my side. Thank you a lot for your kind attention. Thank you so much, Daniel, for this wonderful talk. I'm pretty sure we will have many, many questions because it was just a fantastic talk with fantastic results. Mm -hmm. He loved it. So please, people, come forward with your questions. I know that we have uh, in the audience some uh, experts in quasi-crystals. Experts and non-experts are very welcome to ask questions, you know. <clears throat> okay, let me start then. Um, regarding the Hofstadter uh, butterfly, um, so how did you manage to achieve uh, this uh, simulation? So it's for a finite cluster. I mean, can you say more about the simulation itself? Yeah, the, for the simulation is a pure multiple scattering simulation. So okay. what we do is to take this, uh, that is, we define the cluster, just yeah. the positions. Uh, we select- But it's the, a finite cluster. It's not a yeah. new cluster, it's finite. Yeah. It's finite, yeah. It's, it's a cluster of nearly 100 of uh, scatterers. So that- Good, okay. Mm -hmm. You define the, the positions of the cluster following this, this uh, pattern. Mm -hmm. You define the physical properties of the cluster. We select all them equal and with, with an impedance, which is nearly 100. This is uh, this value here. And then what we do is to plot the, 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 the smaller eigenvalue of the yeah. M matrix as a function of the geometrical uh, of, the, of theta and of frequency, because to compute but it. it in principle, this should be the vanishing determinant, but you look for the minimum. Exactly. It should be a vanishing determinant for the, for the corresponding agent mode. Yeah. Yeah. But if you want a vanishing determinant, you need a complex frequency, because it is an open cluster. Mm -hmm. Since we are not analyzing frequencies in, complex, uh, in the complex plane, we make a sweep only in the real frequency part. I see. And when we see a small value of the smaller agent value, it means that we are close to the determinant equal to zero. That's why we identify the modes as the blue regions in this uh, fractal map. Alors, I've got a, a, a question. The obvious question is, um, if you have the infinite quasi-periodic lattice, okay, uh, your uh, Hofstadter butterfly is a counter set. You know, mm -hmm. but here it's not because it's finite. So how close is it from the real spectrum? I don't know. I have no idea. I don't know how to compute the real spectrum. So obviously we can increase the, the number of scatterers a lot because actually each scatterer adds an equation so that you can have, I mean, maybe a thousand of scatterers because Computing, working with a matrix of thousands of elements is still doable for 
for high, high clusters. But we stop in 100 of the scatterers just to see the, 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 the structure that has the butterfly. Mm -hmm. But I, I don't know yeah. how to compare it with the infinite uh, periodic, the qua infinite quasi periodic system. Because uh, something, you know, um, also you might wish to normalize your, uh, your matrix, no? Because when you increase the, number, uh, the cluster, your minimum, the minimum of your determinant becomes bigger and bigger. And if exactly. you large, your, your, your determinant you go, is going to blow. And yeah. looking for a minimum of it would be still a huge number. You see what I mean? That, that's why we work with the, not with the determinant, because the determinant of the matrix, uh, it blows up very yeah, fast. Yeah, yeah, yeah. If you compute the agent value and you try to find the smaller agent value, it's better. But for a large number of scatterers, you still have problems. Mm. So that, that's why we normally, we don't compare this uh, analysis with different number of scatterers, but just with the same number of scatterers, we find local minimum in there. But that's why we work with the, I didn't mention that, but that's why we work with the smaller agent value instead with the determinant, because numerically the determinant, if you have thousands of scatterers, is painful to compute it, yeah. I see. Uh, uh, Nicolas Fong has a very interesting uh, question. Um, so I, I just quote Nicolas Fong, Professor Fong. As a follow-up question, what is the asymptotic behavior for modes around the minimum eigenvalues? What do you mean by the asymptotic behavior? I think that, uh, uh, Nick, could you, could you speak yourself? Sure, sure, yeah. So as you move close to the, uh, the, those minimal eigenvalues, um, I would assume that uh, you will have a, a dependence uh, of uh, some kind of uh, you know, power law or, or the, the, uh, you know, the yeah, you know, so how, how, how those modes actually you know, approach right, the eigenvalue. Well, we, we haven't analyzed that because you have to to keep in mind that actually these are not solutions of the problem because we are just computing the determinant assuming that we don't have any incident field. The fact that the determinant is not equal to zero uh, means that this is not a solution of the problem. We need an incident field to excite this, uh, this, proper this property. What happens is that if you enforce, you excite the field at a frequency close to the agent mode, what you have is a similar behavior to the agent mode, quite smoothly, actually. You know, but actually the analysis of the agent value is not a solution of the problem. It's just a property of the, of the system, of the, deter the determinant of the matrix. But if, the, if we had a solution of the problem, the determinant should be equal to zero. Since, since this is not equal to zero, it means nothing, actually, this determinant, so that I don't know if it answers your, your question. So that if you wonder what happens with the field as we are close to the resonance, it moves uh, smoothly towards the resonance. What we have is just the scattering by a cluster and suddenly you have this shape and then the shape disappear. So I can give you a gift uh, that Mark uh, did about what happens when we have a plane wave arriving to the cluster, and then we make a frequency sweep of the of this incident field. Yeah, that's uh, quite inspiring. Thank you, thank you, Danny. Okay, thank you, Nick. Uh, <laughs> do we have any more questions? I mean, you can either ask your question in the chat box, like uh, Professor Fong, or just come forward, you know, show your face. I mean, we love to see people for real. Uh, Seb, I have a question. Yeah, um, great. Thanks. Yes. Okay. Uh, thanks for this uh, amazing talk. <laughs> uh, can you go back to slide 40-ish, uh, please? You have like uh, okay. Wait. some ellipse, ellipse in a, a dispersion diagram or something. Yeah, wait, I'm trying to find it. This is 40. Here we go. Yeah. Um, so on the right, you showed, or for one of one of the slides, you showed the um, the eigen modes as you go around the outer ellipse. We also have like a set of smaller ellipses inside here. Yes, this one. 
Um, yeah. You also have a set of smaller ellipses inside. I just wonder what the uh, mirrors would look like there. Sorry, say again. You have, you see, you have a set of smaller ellipses inside the big ellipse. Yeah, exactly. But as you see, they are quite weak. But so is this just because, like, um, so here we're just looking at like the log of the determinant, right? Yeah. If you exactly. like, if we, if that... we, if we up the resolution here, could we like happen to to hit a hit a point where it's perfectly zero? Do you know what I mean? <laughs> yeah, probably. These uh, small uh, uh, lines that you see means that we have we are close to a mode, okay? Mm. But the quality is very small, so that we should add a strong imaginary part in mm. order to fully cancel the determinant. When you add this sm uh, strong imaginary part, it means that the real part of the resonance will also move, so that probably the shape will not be the, that of an ellipse. Probably, I don't know. We just uh, okay, okay. That is yeah, because yeah, I saw like the um, yeah, like yeah, as, as you say, like these inner ellipses, they're not as um, they're not as you know bright because the determinant isn't as close to zero. But I thought maybe it's just an issue that you haven't yeah. got enough this resolution to see. Probably these just uh, lines there. Uh, an indication that something is happening in in there. But but as I say, we are not sure to fully understand uh, this uh, this problem. We are just still trying to to figure it out. So that I I think that at this stage of my career, I can say okay, I don't understand this. But well. We are trying, probably it's a nice geometrical interpretation, but it's not obvious, at least uh, for us. So that is really nice. Okay, great, thank you. Thanks very much, Rich, for this very interesting question. So any more questions, please? I mean, it's a unique, you know, opportunity to speak to a, an expert on quasi-crystals. Yeah, I had a quick question about, so the, I thought the, the robustness analysis you presented was really nice. Uh, so a couple of questions about that, if I may. So for, was that the, the results you showed? I think it's sort of slide seventeen or so. Are they for yeah. the just the, the finite array or the reflected finite array? Uh, this one. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, it was for the reflected. Yeah. Uh huh. Uh huh. And so uh, when you add when you add the randomness, is the randomness preserving the symmetry or not? No. The randomness is not symmetric. The cluster is symmetric, but we add the randomness through all the, the cluster. Okay, that's interesting. And so I guess the, and my, my final question, I guess the randomness is just being added in the direction um, parallel to the direction of the array? Yeah, yeah. The, yeah, okay. Yes, I think so. Yeah, I think we are. But uh, that's a good question. We should add it as well in the vertical direction because we are in a two-dimensional problem. That should be right. Yeah. Yeah, sure. But then conversely, your you know your quasi the interesting behavior is just the one D. Yeah, so, yeah. yeah. Well, it's something nice of multiple scattering that you can make these experiments very quickly, indeed, very quickly. So that uh, it's really nice. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah, sure. Okay. Thanks. Thanks a lot, uh, Davis, for these very nice uh, questions again. So, uh, okay. Um, by the way, Daniel. Uh, Brin is an expert on spectral theory, so um, I, I, I guess, uh, Brin, what you have seen for the Hofstadter spectrum and so on, it's reminiscent of things you have seen before, or? Uh... Yeah, yeah, absolutely. I think yeah. what's interesting is seeing this so clearly in what is a relatively, I mean, 120 scatterers, yeah. is relatively small, if we're honest. Seeing this behavior so clearly is um, is very interesting. Yeah, yeah definitely, it's really really interesting. That yeah. point, yeah, sure. I have a trivial question. I mean, what happens if you zoom in? If you zoom into your uh, spectrum, what do you see? Uh, well, we haven't gone uh, beyond what you see in this uh, plot, but I yeah. see there are some spots. I think it will not be a fractal geometry because finally it's a finite structure. Yeah, but you see, I mean, if it's finite, still you you, you should already see a few levels, you know? Yeah, yeah, okay. And I don't know, we, we will make the, the calculation because as you see here, there is a, yeah. a large number of modes. Yes, yes. yes. 
Yeah, we can we can do simulations are very very fast actually. And, so, uh, yeah. Is it a problem of resolution? Do you do you reach already the result the maximum resolution so that you can't magnify or you can? No, see? no, no, no. We can go. Ah, yeah. you, you you can. Yeah. So zooming in would be really really interesting. I yeah, guess. see 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 the numbers. The numbers are still uh, a couple of digits. Uh, we yeah. can go all the because this is just a very easy function, Hankel function, and the. The cosinus function, so that uh, we can uh, we can go deeper on that. Yeah, that should be really nice. So we'll do it. Yeah, thank you. So we have another very interesting question in the chat. So by Pakize uh, Tavakol. Alors, by the employed method, is it possible in general to define class of the observed modes in terms of bright and dark modes? So what can you say about bright and dark modes? I don't understand. What do you mean by bright and dark modes? Well, you know, it's this kind of uh, uh, modes you uh, you find usually in uh, photonic crystals, you know? Mm. When, when they express themselves or not. Maybe it's best that, uh, you know, uh, the person yeah. who asks the questions. It's like the deep modes in acoustics. Yeah, 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 you know, bright okay. uh, and okay. dark modes in acoustics. You know, you find them in periodic structures as well. Okay. You know, some uh, of them, they don't express them, themselves. And, uh, no, I don't know. We haven't, uh, we haven't explored this. that, but yeah. But yeah. Um, in fact, okay, I have another very trivial question before people ask their own questions. So what kind of strike difference can you see with periodic structures? I mean, what can you see here that you would not find in periodic structures? Just in a, a, a few words. I say that the, the number of modes, the number of resonant frequencies, this is what I'd say that uh, I'm finding here that I cannot find in, in order of the structures. So that uh, what I see is that in very few, essentially you can put a resonance in the frequency that you wish. This is not always possible in periodic structures, maybe doing some uh, defects in band gaps, changing some geometrical parameters. But here, what you have is a, a structure with a small number of scatterers and just tuning very easily some, uh, some uh, geometrical parameters. You can, you can tune the resonance and in a very predictable way. Obviously, when you have disorder, you have sometimes this large number of modes as well, but it's more difficult to predict where they are. Here we have like a behavior of like these vertical lines in the commensurability angles in which you can put the resonance if you can tune the angle with uh, enough precision. This is what I find uh, more interesting, this richness of, of modes. Mm -hmm. And also uh, you have a very rapid uh, phase transition between uh, commensurate and incommensurate. Yeah, exactly. Cases. And you, do you see it when you tune, you know, your rotation? I mean, that, I mean, the, the phase transition is really abrupt. Yeah, well, actually is uh, is marked in this uh, region so that not a phase transition itself, but essentially what, what you see is that uh, we have a mode or not, you know, so that uh, Indeed, we don't have the mode at the commensurable uh, condition, but what we have is near this commensurability condition, the, the modes. Uh, obviously, if you are in a commensurability condition, you have a couple of scatterers located at the same point. For common multiple scattering problems, that's a huge problem because the Green's function appears as the interaction between them. For flexural waves, it doesn't happen because for flexural waves, the Green's function is non It's not singular, yeah. So that, but no, I, I, I think that... I ah, so it. it's very important what you say here, Daniel. You're telling me that if you would look at the Helmholtz equation instead of the Kirchhoff love, then you would see this very rapid phase transition because of yeah. the singularity of the uh, Green function. Yeah, and at least... Ah. And, and unless you normalize the Green's function, you will have problems with working with Helmholtz resonators because I Helmholtz the equation because at some point you will have scatterers at the same position. If you are working with point scatterers, it happens only at the commensurability condition. If you are working with finite circles, 
as they approach each other, you will have a, a mess. So that, yes, but I guess that when you work with point scatterers and the handful equation, you normalize this function to avoid these things, but then you have to make some tricks. So probably you will see the phase transition in that occasion. And do you think it's just a numerical problem or do you think that there is some new underlying physics that you would find in acoustics or electromagnetics that you don't find for, electro, well, for elastodynamic or flexural waves? I don't know because actually since the, since the flexural wave equation is an approximation that comes from Helmholtz yeah. equation, then I don't know what uh, can happen there, yeah. So perhaps due to the fact that you use this approximate model with a regular Green's function means that you miss some effect, possibly. Possibly at the very neighborhood of the commensurability condition probably we're missing something for sure. For sure, okay. yeah. Okay, I'd better stop here myself. I mean, I, I'm, I'm, I'm really excited, you know, that's Thank you. what you're showing, obviously. So people, please, you know, we are very, very uh, thankful to have, I mean, we are really lucky to have Daniel with us today because uh, this is a, an absolutely uh, cutting edge research project that is uh, leading here. And we have experts in elasticity, photonics, applied mathematics. So people, please do not hesitate to ask your question. And you can also drop an email, obviously, to Daniel after this webinar. Yeah, of course. I left my email here if anyone wants to. Perhaps, Daniel, you could say a little bit more words about your project. I mean, what is the overall aim of your project? Well, essentially, we are going to use a phononic structure, for a phononic crystal plates. Uh, to modulate the phase of uh, the optical the optical field, because you know that uh, when we have a vibrating surface, we have some displacement that if we have an incident uh, optical beam on it, it will suffer from this. Uh, it will see this field displacement, and essentially what we want to do is to generate complex patterns based partially in the results that I have shown, based on these complex structures presenting complex uh, field distributions. So that I think is going to be a really nice uh, project because we are, we are going to, to work with an interdisciplinary team. We will work with uh, phononics, optics, and in the final stage of the project, in the application part, we are going to try to use these structures to form images so that we will be working out also on optical imaging. Indeed, actually, my team here is what they do, optical imaging, so that actually, unfortunately, the theoretical part of the project will be far away in my hands. It will be in London, so that I will be all the time disturbing Sebastian and Richard Craster, probably. Uh, but well, in, it is a, quite a nice project because it has all the stages of, a, of the solution of, the, of a problem. That's what I find interesting of these schematics. And well, uh, if any of you is interested on any part of this process, you can obviously send me an email. Uh, we are very excited about the, this project. Probably it will begin in March uh, of, next, of next year. We are working on the grant agreement preparation. As you know, it was a, quite a competitive uh, uh, process. Uh, I think that they, they presented like nearly 900 proposals and only 56 were funded so that we were really lucky uh, with that. And luck is the, the word because as you know, at some point you need the, the luck with, be with you because I'm sure that there were tens of uh, excellent proposals that couldn't continue so that uh, we are really excited with this opportunity for us as well so that but essentially, I think that this is what is nice of this project, that is quite uh, multidisciplinary, and we are going to, to have a lot of fun in this, in, this in this project. We are very lucky to have another question from uh, Professor Fang. So just out of curiosity, can the rotation twist degree of freedom be captured in a form of an Hamiltonian similar to Sidney Gordon equation? So it's in the chat box. Wow. <laughs> <laughs> okay. 
So, so Nick, perhaps you would like to uh, to come forward and say a bit more about that. Yeah, I'm... say again, Nick. Sorry. Yeah. So maybe I missed the very beginning of the problem setting, but uh, I was under impression that uh, uh, there is a uh, you know rotation or twist degree of freedom for the clusters, right? And uh, I'm wondering if uh, uh, we could uh, uh, you know, find a, a, a you know, equivalent gauge, right? The, uh, a gauge similar to a kind of- a, Yeah, you know. no, I don't think so. I mean, mm -hmm. probably you can because equations are equations so that finally you can, you probably can do that. But this was not the proposal of this of this work. Essentially, what we wanted to say is, okay, no approximation at all because we are working with finite structures, mm -hmm. so that we are putting the position of each scatterer into the equations, and then we are uh, just analyzing the problem to see uh, what happens. As I say, uh, this is the advantage of working with in our domain that you know that. Normally, we don't build the number of Avogadro of scatterers, but we build just some uh, tens or hundreds of scatterers so that we can work uh, one by one in our equations so that there is no effective uh, field or effective wave approximation at all in this approach. Mm. It was a pure multiple scattering problem. I see, I see, I see. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Nick. Very interesting question again. So um, please, people, do not hesitate to ask uh, many more questions. Again, we have a unique opportunity to chat, you know, in a friendly way. So um, any question is welcome. OK, I've got another trivial question. Um, you mentioned a few minutes ago that you, you, well, you're using an approximate equation. So do you have in mind to replicate those results uh, using the Navier equation? So the three-dimensional equation, but for a, a plate? Yeah, this is something that I would like to do. Uh, we began to, to think about that, just having, for instance, a plate with blind holes in one side and in the other one, and when you rotate them, even if you arrive to the commensurability conditions, you don't have the scatterers at the same position. So, because you will have this small gap between them, so that, but you will have a strongly trapped wave there. This is the idea that we had in mind. Probably we cannot do this uh, analytically, or at least I don't see how in a trivial way, but this is what I would like to do, even experimentally, is one of the, of the ideas that we have in mind, to, to try to work with these blind holes and see how, as they approach each other, the interaction between the cavities is stronger. Because then you will pass from having a, just a blind hole to have a thin membrane between two holes. This is the, the idea that we will, look, we will have. Always having this approximated solution as a, as a goal, but at some point, you have to go real, and then it's better to, to work with uh, more elaborated methods. Hmm. Fascinating. And uh, going back to Maxwell equation, uh, so do you have at least in mind to, to solve this two-dimensional problem for the Helmholtz equation? No, it's something that... No. Uh, I don't have in mind right now. We consider that, but finally the number of tasks that we have is- uh, Yeah, so it's not a top priority. No, it's not the top priority right now because yeah. we are just a couple of persons here. And of then, course, of course, yeah, yeah, no, no. Uh, but uh, yeah, but I think that's similar because finally some of the, these effects are purely geometrical so that we should expect something similar. But Daniel, uh, can we say that the butterfly uh, Hofstadter spectrum is kind of universal and you expect somehow to retrieve again and again and again the same kind of spectrum in I would say yes context. I, I, I say that uh, it could appear as well for handhold resonate uh, for handhold equation for sure I think is uh, I mean I didn't know that it was Mark who 
who showed me the, the plot, saying, okay, this is what I expect. Uh, he, he told me and I say, okay, if you expected that, uh, congratulations, but <laughs> I couldn't expect that. So mm -hmm. that may, maybe Mark, uh, he's not here, he had to, to, to go, but maybe Mark knows better the answer to, to this question. Mm -hmm. Wonderful. Uh, do we have any more questions from the audience? Uh, I have a question. Yeah. Uh, yes. Of course. Hi, Oliver. Great. Hello. So hey, Oliver. <laughs> Hello. So this makes me think of hexagons of single crystal, which are fitted together with a slight angle between their crystalline axes. Do you get a similar um, phenomenon occurring in that case? What do instead, you of mean? Using, instead of drilling holes, you use single crystals cut into hexagons and then you... Oh. Well, probably yes, but I couldn't say. <laughs> uh, you are mute, uh, Oliver. I don't listen to you, Oliver. Yeah. We can't hear you, Oliver. Uh, you... You need to click to unmute yourself. Ah, I think it's perhaps bad connection. Yeah, maybe. That, that, that was a very interesting question from Oliver. Effectively, uh, perhaps you have uh, similar uh, analogous systems leading to. Uh, yeah. Yeah. Um, okay. Um, I think we had a lovely time with you, and uh, I'm really glad we had the opportunity to, uh, you know, to discover the wonders of quasi crystals with you today. And I would remind people that um, over a year ago we had also the great pleasure to have Emil Prodan giving a, a webinar, and I think it would be fantastic for you to actually also watch uh, Emil's webinar because I think. Daniel yeah, I, and Bill's uh, webinar uh, talk to each other very well. I, I, I think it's, it's, it's really great uh, that um, we, we had uh, this pleasure to welcome both uh, Emil and uh, Daniel uh, in our uh, webinar series. So thank you very much again, Daniel, uh, for this wonderful- Thank you. Thanks, everyone. And uh, Bogdan, uh, uh, could you kindly uh, let us know who will be our next uh, webinar uh, speaker? So next week we'll have uh, Stefan Brulé from uh, Menard Company, so an industrial partner, speaking about uh, metamaterials and uh, civil engineering application for, for metamaterials, large-scale metamaterials. And uh, of course, for this one, uh, Bogdan will be definitely the chairman because Bogdan has a very strong background in civil engineering, as well as, he, as you know, in uh, mathematics. So, um, yeah, and, and I think it will be uh, really lovely to, you know, uh, go from uh, Daniel's uh, webinar to uh, Stefan's webinar because essentially uh, Stefan Brilley will speak of very large scene plates. So um, again, there is some kind of connection. Okay, uh, bravo, uh, just bravo, that was fantastic. Thank you so much, uh, Daniel. And uh, thank you very Daniel. much uh, everyone for your support. Uh, I mean, this can only exist uh, Without you, with you, with, without you, uh, this webinar uh, series uh, cannot persist. Thank you so much for uh, being with us today again. Bye. Thanks. Bye. Have a good evening.